The text this morning is taken, taken from the prophet Micah, starting at chapter 1, verse 1. These are the words of God. The word of the Lord came to Micah, the Morsite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein it, and all that therein is. And let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord cometh forth out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft as wax before the fire, and as the waters that are poured down a steep place. For the transgression of Jacob is all this, and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria as a heap of the field and as plantings of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations thereof. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with the fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate, for, the gathered it, for she gathered it as the hire of a harlot, and they shall return to the hire of an harlot. Therefore, I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons and mourning as the owls. For, who, for her wound is incurable. For it has come unto Judah. He has come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. Declare ye, not, declare ye it not at Gath. Weep ye not at all. In the house of Ephra, roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away, thou inhabitants of Saphir. Having thy shame naked, the inhabitant of Zan, came not forth in the morning of Beth, Bethezel. He shall receive of his standing. He shall receive you his standing. For the inhabitant of Meroth waiteth carefully for good, but evil came down from the Lord unto the gate of Jerusalem. O thou inhabitant of Lachish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin to the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Therefore shalt thou give presents to Moresheth Gath. The house of Achib shall be a lie to the kings of Israel. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Marisha. He shall come unto Adullam, the, the glory of Israel. Make thee bald and pull thee for delicate children. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into captivity from thee. Our Father in God, we thank you for your word. I pray you give us eyes and eyes to see, understanding to grasp. I pray that your spirit would be at work in our midst. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So remember that last week we talked about the, we gave an overview of the prophet Micah, and remember that the the book is basically three set three oracles clustered in um, clustered according to a pattern. That pattern being warning, judgment, and hope. So three times the prophet cycles through this. He cycles through warning, judgment, and hope, and then he does it again, and then he does it a third time. So each one of these bundled oracles, each one of these bundled oracles follows the same three-part pattern. The text this morning is the first part of the first group. In other words, it's the warning for the first oracle. So the passage is one of warning. Micah, who is from a place called Morasheth, tells us that he ministered from the reigns of Jotham to Hezekiah. All right, that's in verse 1. He, he ministered from the reigns of Jotham to Hezekiah, and that his message was for both kingdoms. His message was for the kingdom of Judah to the south and the kingdom of Israel to the north. It was necessary for the people to listen to this warning because God, was, God himself was speaking, and he was speaking from his holy temple. That's in verse 2. God is speaking from his holy temple. Remember I told you last week that each one begins with listen, listen up. Hear this, O Israel. God was going to come down and he was going to walk on the high places and the mountains were going to melt underneath him. We see that in verses three and four. God himself is going to come down. He's going to walk on the high places and the mountains are going to melt. He's going to do this because of the transgressions of both kingdoms, he says, both of which were rotting from the head. Both kingdoms were rotting from the head. Judah from Jerusalem, and Israel from Samaria, which was the capital city. Samaria was going to be dismantled, verse 6. All her idols were going to be destroyed, and her whorish wealth was going to come to nothing, in verse 7. Micah, the prophet, was going to wail like desolate animals. All right, he was going to wail like desolate 
uh, animals. And uh, the KJV has dragons and owls here, while the transla some translations have jackals and ostriches. But in any case, creatures of desolate places. It's one thing to be destroyed, and quite another to have your enemies laughing at you while it's going on. That's in verse 10. So not only, are, not only is Israel going to be destroyed, but Israel is going to be destroyed and the enemies of God are going to be chortling while it happens. A series of cities are then named with various plays on words being made on their names. They're all going to participate in the destruction. They're all going to be recipients of this destruction, verses 11 and 12. The naming of, uh, naming of a particular city, Lachish, here stands out because it was a city in Judah. So Lachish is a city in Judah in the southern kingdom through which the corruptions of Israel to the north had begun to seep into Judah. So Judah was lagging behind Israel. Israel was worse. Judah was not as bad. But the way the corruptions of Israel got into Judah was through this particular city, this city, Lachish. She was the start of trouble for the south. Micah, as a messenger from God, did not pass by his hometown. You see that in verse 14, Moresheth. So we, we learn in verse 1 that Micah is from Moresheth, and he lets Moresheth have it in verse 14. And Adullam was a wilderness stronghold, and the glory of Israel was going to have to hide there. Verse 15. You remember Adullam, was, there was a great cave in Adullam, and that's where David, when he was running from King Saul... Uh, he, he hid out in the wilderness. He was out there hiding in the cave of Adullam. Well, the glory of Israel is going to have to go out there and hide there. Mourning and lamentation were all in order, like a molting eagle. That's something that eagles do. They, they go through periods of dropping all their feathers. So like a molting eagle, this is the way Israel and Judah should be because captivity, verse 16, is coming. So thus far the warning. This is the warning that Micah gives to both kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Samaria, as I've mentioned a number of times, Samaria is the capital city to the north. And I'll remind you that you don't get confused because it's a region in the New Testament. Samaria is a region inhabited by Samaritans. In the Old Testament, Samaria is a city. It's the city of the, of the north, the capital city of the north, and all of Israel was ruled from Samaria. So in the Old Testament, you don't have Samaria and Samaritans. You have Israelites to the north and the capital city of Samaria. So Samaria was the capital city to the north, and Jerusalem was the capital of Judah to the south, verse 5. And the people out in the rural area, the people out in the rural areas could not say anything like, don't blame me, I voted for the other Jeroboam. We like to do that. We like to say, I'm not responsible. Don't blame me, I voted for the other guy. Well, that doesn't work in this situation. What is, um, how, how would Micah speak to us? What is the transgression of America? Is it not Washington? All right. What is what is the transgression of Idaho? Is it not Boise? What is the transgression of Washington? Is it not Olympia? So the, you can't say, well, look at those urbanites over there doing those awful things, and then we're, we're clean and pure red staters out here. It doesn't work that way. Many of the corruptions, many of the corruptions are more manifest in urban areas. They're more manifest in centers of power like New York or Washington. They're more manifest, but simply because they're concentrated, right? They're simply concentrated. That's where the big decisions are made. And oftentimes you can say, oh, look at that appalling big decision. But those decisions are revelatory of corruptions in the whole body. Those those awful things that are done in our state capitals, those awful things that are done in our national capital are representative of the whole body. Who keeps electing these people? All right. Whose congressmen are they? Who, who put them in charge? And in any case, when the judgment falls, it falls on the entire body. All right. It falls on the entire body. There is a gospel grace exception to this, which I'm going to uh, address in a, in a little bit. But as a general rule, uh, understand that you can't have any horizontal distinctions, red state, blue state, urban, rural, uh, educated, uneducated, those, those are not the distinctive marks that will protect 
anyone because the head rots from the, bo- the, the, the body rots from the head and the body contributes to the rotting from the head. That's the pattern that Micah is addressing. What is the corruption? What is the problem with Israel? Is it not Samaria? Isn't that the place where it's, everything is concentrated and where you can see what's actually going on? And what is, what is the problem with Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Jerusalem is Judah's problem. All right, that's the symptom. That's where it all comes, uh, becomes manifest, becomes apparent. There's another thing that we learn from this, uh, in this section, and that is corruption follows a path. Corruption follows a path. The great curse in this section, the reason for the judgment that is going to fall upon them, is because of idolatry. Idolatry is the problem. Idolatry is the problem. The Lord pronounces a warning over the high places that he's going to tread down. That's in verse 2. The Lord's going to come down and he's going to walk. He's going to trample down. He's going to tread down the high places. The high places were places of worship and sacrifice. Sometimes the high places were places where they worshiped Yahweh. Other, uh, more frequently, the high places were places where they set up groves and altars to false gods, to other gods. In any case, God was not pleased with the high places where he was worshipped and he was uh, angry with the high places where idols were worshipped. He was going to come down, he was going to walk on the high places and the mountains were going to melt under his feet. And he says that Samaria is going to be shattered because of her carved images, it says in verse 7. And it says her idols are going to be laid desolate. So we see here the problem is false worship. The problem that Micah is addressing is false worship. Worship that is not according to scripture. High places, carved images, and idols. Now the northern kingdom had abandoned the true worship of God. And had done this wholesale. Right? It was done early on from the beginning. Right? It was done very, um, very early on. So when the, the kingdom separated, what happened was the king of the north did say, I don't, want, I don't want to divide politically from Judah to the south, Israel to the north, Judah to the south, and have all the Israelites going down to Jerusalem in the south to worship because that's going to keep our countries united. And I want them divided. I want to protect my territory. I want to, I want to, so we're going to have to have our own religion. So he set up golden calves at Dan and Bethel in Israel. And he deliberately led Israel into false idolatry to keep them from going down to Jerusalem to worship. So Israel had apostatized early on. They'd done it wholesale. That apostasy had begun to seep into Judah which had stayed faithful longer. So if you look at the kings of Israel to the north, they're all bad guys, all right? Sometimes they're, uh, they've got a conscience and they listen to the prophets occasionally, but they're, they're, there's not one good, righteous, godly king in all of Israel, the, the northern kingdom of Israel's history. Uh, in, the king, in Judah to the south, there are a number of kings who are righteous. Jehoshaphat and Josiah and Hezekiah and David and Solomon for a stretch. You have a number of kings who were righteous and who ruled in a way that pleased the Lord. So you had wholesale apostasy to the north and you had struggles to the south. So sometimes about half the time you get a wicked king and other times you get a a B B minus king and other times you get a, a, a king like Josiah who follows the Lord wholeheartedly. But the apostasy from the north had begun to seep into Judah. Judah had stayed faithful longer but still the corruptions came. They came, the prophet Micah tells us, they came through Lachish which was the beginning of sin for the daughter of Zion. That's how he puts it. Lachish in Judah was the beginning of sin for the daughter of Zion. Zion was the mountain in Jerusalem where the tabernacle of David had been. So the temple is on Mount Moriah. The tabernacle of David, the the tabernacle of praise had been set up on Zion. Then after the temple was built, that was um, dismantled and taken up into the temple. So the language of Zion is oftentimes applied to Moriah, applied to the temple. Uh, but it's associated with Jerusalem. So the beginning of the sin for the daughter of Zion, the southern kingdom, begins, comes through Lachish. The transgressions of Israel were found in her, it says in verse 13. So the northern kingdom was apostate 
And the southern kingdom was compromised and syncretistic. Compromised and syncretistic. Syncretism means you try to mix, mix and match. You try to combine elements from the pagan religions. You want elements of paganism and elements of Christianity. All right, so uh, that's syncretism. The northern kingdom would just went apostate. The southern kingdom tried to have it both ways. Both of them received here and other places, both of them received God's warning of a coming captivity. Both of them received a dire warning. Sargon II of Assyria finally conquered Samaria in 722 BC, which means that Micah lived through the fulfillment of this prophecy. Micah, Micah's ministry from Jotham to um, uh, Jotham to what did I say, Hezekiah. Uh, so through, uh, so his his pattern from Jotham through Hezekiah, his ministry encompasses the fall of Samaria to the north. So Sargon II of Assyria comes in and wipes out the northern kingdom and takes all the uh, Israelites to the uh, off into captivity, and we don't really hear from them again in terms of tribal identity. Now some people, I'll just say this uh, as a parenthesis, some people have made a great deal out of the 10 lost tribes of Israel. They're taken into, uh, they're taken into captivity and there, there are some weird cults that, that uh, they're called uh, British Is Israelitism or uh, 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 Anglo-Israelitism -Is where they say that the Anglo races are the 10 lost tribes of Israel and, and it's weird juju and don't pay any attention to it. The tribe of Dan settled Denmark and, you know, Denmark. <laughs> uh, well, that, that's, not, that's not exactly uh, right. There was tribal identity. Uh, even though the, ten lost, the tribes are taken off into captivity, there were um, members of the, those ten tribes in the south who kept a record of who they, uh, you know, who they were. In the book of Acts, um, and that, that remained the case until the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, where all the genealogical records were kept. When that happened, the records for all 12 tribes were lost. But in the New Testament, Paul says one type place in the book of Acts, uh, this is the hope that our 12 tribes, he says, our, tri our 12 tribes are looking forward to. And uh, Anna, the prophetess, when Jesus was born and came to the temple, she was from the tribe of Asher. So in, in the south, there were three tribes. There was, there was uh, uh, Judah, there was Benjamin, and then there was Levi. There was three tribes to the south. And then you had people, odd, odd people like Asher. There still was tribal identity until the temple was destroyed. So don't pay any attention to 10 lost tribes uh, nonsense. That's, that's not what this is all about. So the transgressions of Israel were found in Lachish, and then were transmitted into Judah. Sargon II conquers Samaria in 722, and then Babylon carries Judah off in various waves. There's some question of when the stopwatch, you, you know that uh, Judah was in exile in Babylon for 70 years, but there is some question and debate about when the stopwatch started, because the exile started in waves, so th different people were taken off at different times. So, um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 608 to 586, Jehoiakim was deposed in 597. That means that Micah ministered the better part of a century before the fulfillment with Judah. So, the fulfillment with Israel happened during Micah's lifetime, and the uh, fulfillment with Judah happened after Micah was done with his ministry. Judah was not as bad as Israel. Judah was not as bad as Israel, and their judgment came later, and it was less severe. Right? It, was, it came later, and it was less severe, but it was plenty severe enough. Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, the people of Israel were in Babylon, and they, uh, they lamented their condition in Babylon. The full-scale corruptions to the north had been judged, and the syncretistic compromises of the south were also judged. God had no use for either. God didn't have any use for the full tilt rebellion, and he had no, uh, uh, no use for the let's have it both ways, let's combine the best contributions of paganism and Christianity. And you might say, well, that, nobody does that. Look, the, almost the entire evangelical church in North America today is doing that. 
That's, that's what all this woke stuff is. This woke stuff is an attempt to combine a resurgent neo-paganism with the categories and terminology of Christianity. That's what syncretism looks like. Syncretism is not going to, someone's not going to come and say, hey, let's, why don't you let me combine the teachings of God and the teachings of the, of the devil? That's not how syncretism works. What, what syncretism will say is, hey, look, I just discovered what the book of Romans was about all along. And it turns out that the book of Romans was all about what I just learned from my uh, secular sources uh, last week. So God has no use for syncretism. And syncretism is oftentimes worse. Syncretism is worse because for children of God, it's more deceptive. When, when, when you're dealing with out-and-out pagans, oftentimes you can tell, he, well, there's a pagan. Right? He's, he's an out-and-out pagan. When you have someone who's masquerading as a Christian, oftentimes simple Christians are deluded. But God has no use for either. Sin, sin remember, had a point of entry in Judah. We live in a time when the world outside the church is like Samaria. It's like the northern kingdom of Israel. They used to be faithful centuries ago, but now they are wholly given over to their idols. They deny the God of heaven and want to be allowed to live as though there were no God in heaven. They are given over to their idols. And so the question for us within the church is this, where is our Lachish? Where is our Lachish? Where are we importing this stuff? What have we tolerated just a little bit of? What have we tolerated just a little portion of, just a little bit of? Which lymph node have we given permission to be cancerous? That's what's happened. The church has given permission for a little bit of cancer in this little tiny lymph node, and, and I don't think it's going to be a big problem. I think we can manage it. Don't be hysterical. Don't be alarmist. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but if you... Uh, if you got x-rays at the doctor, I would want the, the radiologist, I would want the oncologist to be alarmist if he saw something. And he, you don't want to say, I didn't want to say anything because it wasn't bigger than a softball. <laughs> no, I, I want doctors to be alarmist. This doesn't look good. I know, I've, I've studied this. I know where this goes. I know what happens next. And I know what this is going to look like next year. So we want to know, what, is, what lakish have we, are we putting up with? What, sort of, what sorts of things are we giving the time of day to that we ought not to be giving the time of day to? Now, I said earlier that you can't really opt out of this sort of thing by saying, well, yeah, but I live, I, I live in a reasonably conservative part of the country. It, it doesn't work like that. You can't, you can't hide behind conservative parts of the country. You can't hide behind traditional values. You can't hide behind historic voting patterns in this region. That's not, that's not a shelter. That's not a fortress. That's not a wall. The only refuge for a Christian is Christ. The only refuge for anyone is Christ. Judgment is not avoided. Judgment is not avoidable through any urban rural divide. Nor is it avoided through anything as simple as a red state, blue state kind of thing. We are represented by leaders who are better than any of us deserve. Our current crop of rulers, who are pretty bad, are better than we deserve. God could give us worse and no injustice. That leadership does encompass all of us. Is there, therefore, no hope? No, there is hope. We can see a repeated pattern in Scripture that we can take encouragement from. It's what we see in the land of Goshen. God often sets his people apart within a larger culture that when that larger culture is under judgment. And he protects them in that set-apart place. But that set-apart place is not set apart through anything that we are able to cook up. It's not anything that we can devise. It's not any place we can go. The only thing we can do is take refuge in Christ. It's got to be in Christ. The world was flooded, for example. The world was flooded, but Noah and his family were saved in the ark. God provided an ark to protect them. 1 Peter 3.20 The plagues rained down on Egypt, 
but the Israelites were spared in the region of Goshen. That's in Exodus 8.22, Exodus 9.26. And there are occasions when someone is standing a little bit close, too close to the edge. Remember the Lord Jesus said solemnly, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. So Lot and his family were graciously taken out of Sodom when the, right before the fire was going to fall. And Lot's wife apparently thought she was, you know, there are malls back there. There's great shopping back there. And I, I want to go back on the precipice and look one last longing glance at what I'm going to, what I'm going to lose. And the, and the Lord, admonition of the Lord is, you're going to lose more than that, sister. Right? You're, you're not going to just lose those things. You are dallying with things you ought not. You need, when the angels say flee, when the angels say get out of here, you need to get out of here and you need to not look back. The refuge there, though, is not this place as opposed to that place. The refuge is the word of the, word of the Lord as mediated through the angels, right? So in the days of Elijah, there were 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. And this is key. And God knew that number. God knew how many there were that had not bowed the knee to Baal. You see that in 1 Kings 19.18. And Paul refers to it in Romans 11.4. Elijah thought that he was the only one left. God, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one who has been faithful to you. And now they're trying to kill me. I've been faithful. They're trying to kill me. And God encourages him and says, no, there are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Elijah didn't know that there were 7,000, and God did know 7,000. He knew the number. That means he knew the number, and he knew their names. God knew their names. He knew where they lived. He knew their faces. He knew their families. And an angel, angels put marks on the people of God who were under God's protection. We see that happening in Ezekiel 9, 4, and in Revelation 7, 1 through 8. The beast puts his mark on his people. God puts his mark on his people. The beast says, I want the, the mark of the beast 666 to put, be put on the right hand or on the forehead. This is where the law of God in Deuteronomy, the law of God was to be bound on your right hand or on your forehead. So this is a counterfeit religion. This is a false religion. This is idolatry, an, an idol wanting to, be, to occupy the place of Jehovah. So God knows how to mark his people. God knows how to mark his people. He knows how to mark his people for protection. And that mark is faith. That mark is trust in Christ. When you turn to Christ, when you trust yourself to Christ, when you resort to Christ, he is your fortress. Only Christ can be your fortress in a time like this. Where can you go? Where, can you, where could you go to opt out of what's going on around us? Do you see the lords of this earth, small l, the aspiring lords of this earth want to run everything. They want to run everything. They want to control all information. They want to control all the stories. The inventions we have are remarkable. I've got an uh, iPhone here that can connect to virtually any library in the world, right? So I've got this device in my pocket and the totalitarian lords of this earth want to control what goes into that phone and what goes out of that phone. They want to control it all. And I can't I can't protect myself by figuring out what their master plan is. I can't protect myself by going in for conspiracy theories. I can't protect myself by moving, you know, quick, run around uh, wildly. None of that is a protection. God's people are protected when they worship him, when they turn to Christ. And you can turn to Christ wherever you are. You can be locked up in a dungeon and turn to Christ. You can be in a prison camp and turn to Christ. You can be in a safe suburban home and turn to Christ. You, you, and this is what you must do. The only way to opt out of the world system, which includes all the judgments that are coming, and make no mistake, there are judgments coming. God did not, God does not say, oh, judgment, that's an old covenant thing, or that's an old testament thing. The Bible tells us repeatedly that God works this way through all of human history. God is in heaven. He does as he pleases. God always hates sin, and he always deals with it. He doesn't deal with it on our timetable. He doesn't deal with it according to our methods, but he deals with it. And when we see that coming by faith, when we see that coming, we need to opt out of the world system through the saving expedient 
of belonging to a different world. This world is under judgment. We need to belong to a different world. This race of Adam is under judgment. We need a new Adam. We need a new head. We need a, we need a hu new human race. This world, this new world, is the work of Christ. This new world is the work of Christ. In Revelation 21.5 it says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Jesus Christ makes all things new. If you want to be made new, along with all things, resort to him, come to him. That new world is taking shape here, in the midst of the shambolic ruins of the old world. But in the meantime, you need to know that the angel of the Lord has put his mark on you. And that means it has to be all about Christ. That mark has to be Christ. That mark has to be blood. That mark has to be what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So, you turn to him in faith and you ask him to mark you. You can't mark yourself for him. You turn to him and ask him to mark you. You ask him to protect you. These are, the, are true words, which they must be. That's because they are the words of Christ. These are troubled times. You are alive in troubled times. As, but as we sing in Psalm 20, the Lord keep thee in troubled times. That's where we are. You have Psalms. You have the word. You have Christ. You have forgiveness. You, you have the word of God over against the words of men. Men are liars. God, let, let God be true and every man a liar. God is the one who has spoken a sure word. These are troubled times and there really is only one refuge. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. If you're a Christian, keep coming to Christ. If you're not a Christian, come to Christ. Turn to him. Call out to him. And he has made a way for you to come to the Father through him. Our Father and gracious God, we're very grateful to you for all that you've given to us. We thank you and praise you for the gospel of grace. We thank you for the labors of our brother Micah. We thank you for the words that he spoke to Israel and to Judah. We thank you for how they've spoken to us. I pray, Father, that you would watch over us and keep us as we seek to be your servants. Help us to resort to your Son as our only fortress. Father, as we pray this way, we would repeat back to you the words that Jesus taught us how to pray, saying, The Roman Catholic error as regards the Lord's Supper is in seeing it as a recurrence of Christ's sacrifice for sin. In that respect, they come to an altar, not a table. That view leads to treating these elements as a means of appeasing God. You take the supper to avoid God's anger. The problem with that take is that Jesus instituted this sacrament at a meal in the warmth of an upper room and not at an altar for burnt offerings. In terms of Israel's sacrificial system, this isn't a sin offering before us, it's a peace offering. We don't take this sacrament to appease God, but because God has already been appeased, Christ's blood covers your sin so that you might enjoy a feast of his presence in his presence. This sacrament isn't a means of atoning our sins. It is the blessing purchased by Christ's atonement. Your sins have already been washed away, consumed in the fire, and now you are invited to sanctify and celebrate the name of Yahweh. In the peace offering, the worshiper partook of a portion of the offered animal. It was a shared meal of gratitude, not a ceremony to cover guilt. But as a peace offering, we should ask, what is it that is ascending to God? The answer is that we're told that in our worship, we are to be living sacrifices, Romans 1, 1 through 2. Since in this supper, we hold forth the token of our union with Christ, it follows that in Christ, we are the offering, we are the sacrifice. And in Christ, the true sin offering, in Christ, the true sin offering, our guilt is washed away. In Christ, the true peace offering, we ascend to the Father as a pleasing aroma. The glory displayed here is God delighting in us as we delight in him. So come in faith and welcome to Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's the charge. We do, in fact, live in troubled times. There is a lot of trouble out there. There's immediate trouble, there's intermediate trouble, and there's distant trouble. It's all trouble. Job said, the book of Job says, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. There's a lot of trouble. So ever, whenever you look at the world, you see your troubles. But you can't 
look to the world and see your salvation. You can see your troubles there, but in order to see your salvation, you have to look to Christ at the right hand of the Father. Set your minds on things above, Paul says in Colossians. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.